there's definitely some things about the WeWork business model, I think, that could theoretically work. And how WeWork makes their money, they have three primary revenue streams. Um, the first revenue stream is called Space as a Service, uh, which is a very clever gimmicky marketing way of, of so that they could use the acronym SAS. <laughs> but WeWork primarily serves tech companies. So uh, startups, um, enterprise companies like Google, I think, uses them. I believe Meta as well. How it works is these companies, um, or, or whether startups or, or large companies, um, they want to have flexible workspaces because if you're not certain about headcount, especially in the days after Corona, when a lot of these tech companies are trying to call their employees back and the employees, a lot of them don't really want to come back to the office and want to stay working remote, or you have employees who want to be in a hybrid model where they come in about two or three days out of the week. Um, as well with tech companies right now going through layoffs, and I believe there's still going to be rounds of layoffs coming through or restructuring, however you want to call it. Um, these companies sometimes don't know how their headcount is going to look. So rather than getting a long-term lease for 10, 15 years and um, doing capital uh, expenditures in order to build up an office that later on they may not use, a lot of these companies would actually prefer to use a service like WeWork, where if they need their employees to be at a certain place at a certain time in the workplace. Uh, they can just go on WeWork, rent out to space um, online. Um, and normally, uh, the typical range of how, how long a tech company rents out a WeWork office uh, could be anywhere around uh, 19 or 20 or so months. And you can rent out desks, you can rent out private offices, whole buildings even, sometimes a floor. Uh, but that's where WeWork makes primarily most of their money. WeWork is a company that would go and actually get these long-term leases for 10, 15 years or so. So they take on that risk. And then they would would then sublease that company, uh, th that space to the tech companies that need it. So uh, we work lately in 2020 or 2021 or so, they launched their all access pass. Now, this is the second way that WeWork makes money. Essentially, they're selling memberships that provide them recurring revenue. And these memberships allow anybody to be able to work in a number of different WeWork locations. There's actually about six, 700 of those worldwide. And wherever there is an empty vacancy, they can go into that WeWork and, and actually use that office space. So I think this all access pass more is tailored towards smaller businesses or startups startups um, or individual contractors who maybe are like software developers uh, for them to be able to work wherever they want to, provided that there's enough space. And their third method of generating revenue is through their WeWork workplace software solution. This is through a partnership they have with a company called Yardi. Um, essentially, it's, it's a solution that's tailored towards enterprise companies for them to manage their WeWork footprints. So being able to track where the employees are at whatever given time, helping employees be able to book rooms whenever they need to, and also just providing tools in general to help these enterprise companies make the most out of their WeWork investment. Primarily, the vast majority of WeWork's revenue comes from their um, comes from their space as a service solution, uh, which is those um, nineteen or twenty month leases. Although they are trying to grow their all access demand passes in order to help fill up occupancy for a lot of these locations, and the workplace solution, of course, is very high margin, but it makes up a very low uh, percentage of WeWork's total revenue at this moment. So WeWork um, is one of the biggest uh, office leasers in the world. Um, if we look at just including joint ventures as well as um, 
unconsolidated franchises. They have about 781 locations, um, almost a million different workspaces, um, and uh, there's about 664,000 or so physical memberships, uh, 77,000 all-access passes. Um, the bottom here, it shows they're consolidated, which is these are the uh, regions that are uh, under the WeWork brand. Um, sorry, under the WeWork umbrella, while the system-wide ones are are including like affiliated um, franchises as well as joint joint ventures. So it's a pretty sizable footprint that WeWork has. And if we were to just look at those individual factors for WeWork, you might not actually think this business is actually all that bad. In fact, uh, the business model has potential. Uh, but the main problem with WeWork here is its balance sheet and income statement. You can see here that um, they really don't have much cash, and WeWork has notoriously been very famous for lighting money on fire. <laughs> I think around the time, I think it was 2019, they were losing like five or six thousand dollars per minute or something. It was something nuts. Um, right now, they have improved their unit economics a little bit, but they are still very much bleeding cash. Uh, they have about seven hundred and forty-four million dollars in current assets, about nine hundred um, nine billion two hundred seventy-five million dollars in the uh, assets they have for for leases. So being able to use the space that they currently have. Um, however, if you look at their um, sorry, if you look at their current liabilities here, um, you can see that they. They owe two billion one hundred eighty nine million throughout this whole year, so they are definitely facing a liquidity uh, liquidity crunch. Um, they are in danger of not being able to repay a lot of um, a lot of their lease obligations as well as just their bills in general. Um, and you can see here that this long term lease obligation number is about three about four billion dollars more than the assets. So. Um, what probably happened here is we work around when they were doing their blitz scaling and going big, go big or go home. Uh, they probably didn't negotiate very good lease agreements because now they're valuing the asset much lower than the liability of being able to use um, the, those workspaces that they've engaged in long-term leases for. So this is a big problem uh, for WeWork right now. And they also have about $2.9 billion in debt. Um, recently, actually, in around March or so, they were facing a liquidity crunch and they had a bunch of debt that was due in 2025 that they had no way of paying. So what happened was um, they took some of this long-term debt and about $1 billion of it got converted into equity. So this was from SoftBank's end. Uh, what happened was SoftBank was like, you know what? Take $1 billion, convert it into ownership in the company. And what WeWork did was they issued a bunch of new shares, gave them to SoftBank, and diluted the hell out of all the other shareholders. Um, so that happened. Um, the interest rate for the debt that got pushed out because they pushed out some of the debt from 2025 to 2027 and the interest rate for those debt pieces went from five to seven percent to like 12 to 15 percent so it's pretty crazy although the uh, interest rate isn't that bad because a portion of it i believe it's like maybe seven percent or so or, or seven eight percent of it is is paid in stock so it's not the worst thing in the world but still um, they definitely are facing a lot of liquidity issues right now if we look at their income statement, you can see that WeWork has been making some progress towards becoming more profitable, but they still have a long way to go. Um, you can see here that they they do make money on their on their lease operations, but their margins are pretty thin. I think their their margins, gross margins, are probably around ten or or, or maybe fifteen percent or so, fifteen sixteen percent. But WeWork has very high GNA expenses. And the reason behind this is when you take on a short-term lease, um, you have to worry about keeping your customers happy. So um, there's... Uh, there's expenses involved in making their workplaces look nice. Um, in fact, that's really WeWork's um, main um, 
differentiator or value proposition, let's just say. I was watching an older interview of Adam Newman in 2017 trying to explain why his business should justify a $47 billion valuation. Um, and, <laughs> um, it was really funny because the, the interviewer kept asking him, so like, what's your competitive advantage, Adam? And Adam was just being like, listen, um, our business is about making sure people can grow together, can motivate each other, can live communally and we have that energy and the energy is what makes us valuable something to that regard is but there are lots of companies that make beautiful spaces um, but they're not worth 20 billion dollars which is WeWork's most recent valuation so I wonder what do you consider to be your special sauce you know people look at Apple and they say okay well design is their special sauce. They look at Google and they say a mastery of, of software and search technology is their special sauce. What's your special sauce? So f first of all, excellent question. From the first day that we started WeWork, it was about bringing people together. As our mission, and our mission always grows, and our mission people make a life and not just a living. <laughs> the point was to actually do something new, to humanize work. And you know, if you think about it, in, uh, 10 years ago, as social networks and, and these huge media companies were getting bigger and bigger, we were promised a world where technology was going to bring us together, was going to connect us. Observing myself now, some of the young 16 and 17-year-old um, teenagers that I know that spend more time at home and are on Instagram and on Facebook and they're doing all the, but they're not really connected physically to anyone. If you, if you notice, they don't even look you in the eyes as much and they're so busy on their phones. Technology for a lot of people actually disconnected them. And we work was always about bringing people together. And now as we're seeing where the world is going, we feel that our message is stronger than it's ever been before. And, uh, and we're just announcing a new direction of, of really humanize this earth, humanize work, and humanize living, and humanize hospitality, and bring back the things that were so natural to all of us when we were kids, and somehow we were educated out of them, we were pushed out of them, for whatever the reason is. And the one thing when people say, are you a co-working space? We're as much a co-working space as Amazon is a book-selling store. <laughs> Anybody who thought that Amazon was there just to sell books just didn't understand the vision, and you just need to look now and see how much greater the vision is. Three or four years later, they still haven't figure out much of a competitive advantage. Um, WeWork's main competitive advantage is their brand recognition, where they spent about $18 billion or so in order to get, um, as well as the fact that they do have a nice design aesthetic to a lot of their um, rooms. Um, so uh, a lot of WeWork locations have like free beer. Um, they have uh, kombucha machines. Um, they The area looks very nice and very minimalistic, which appeals to a lot of people in tech. Um, but in order to keep that and make their areas look nice, they have to spend money to do that. Um, and if there is a customer or a startup that goes out of business, well, WeWork then has to spend money to try to fill that vacancy or that occupancy. And God forbid a, an enterprise client churns, because if an enterprise client churns and WeWork can't find another enterprise client within that same quarter, well, their occupancy rates are going to suffer as a result. So to keep occupancy rates uh, good and to make sure their clients are happy and and that they have like really nice decorated rooms and equipment and desks and chairs sofas they need to invest a lot of money into upkeeping all of that which is why their gna expenses is so high Let's actually go into um, what exactly is going on recently. So there's this guy named Sandeep Mathrani, I think that's how you pronounce his last name. And he was brought in in 2020 in order to fix WeWork. Because when WeWork released their S1 in uh, 2019, everybody freaked out. Because all sorts of things came out about how Adam Newman was buying uh big apartments and then leasing them to WeWork. It was doing all kinds of crazy spending things like getting a private jet, going into We Live, which is like trying to do WeWork, but like the residential version of it. There was also We Learn, which was something managed by his uh, 5G conspiracist wife, um, Rebecca Newman, uh, who wanted to reinvent education. Uh, they were making a bunch of weird investments in different areas. And um, investors, when when they read that, just freaked out. So um, the, the 
blowback was pretty hard for that. Eventually, what SoftBank did is they showed up to Adam Newman and was like, listen, bro, uh, you have to go. Um, we'll pay you $1.7 billion so you can leave, but you got you to gotta hand over control for the business. So um, Adam Newman took the $1.7 billion, wiped away some of his tears with it, and, and he ended up leaving. And they brought in somebody actually with a lot of really good um, uh, real estate experience. So Sandeep was originally uh, pretty high up in a company called Brookfield. Uh, he was actually part of Brookfield Properties. So they brought him in and his goal was to right the ship. But um, while he did make a lot of progress in improving the occupancy rates as well as unit economics and saving some money and renegotiating some of the leases, um, he was rather inconsistent in when he thought WeWork was going to be profitable. So at first he was like, we're going to be free cash flow plus positive by end of 2022 and then that didn't happen and then he went and an earnings call was like we're going to be free cash flow positive in q1 of 2023 and it didn't end up happening so in their most recent call um that was in q1 of 2023 um he kind of got grilled by a lot of analysts analysts were like listen when are you going to be profitable man and he said 2024 and the analyst was like, are you sure? Because you made a bunch of promises before that you couldn't keep. And I was like, absolutely, 100%. I am positive we're going to be free cash flow positive in 2024. <laughs> um, and uh, it was kind of a back and forth. The analyst wasn't taking any BS from Sandeep. And uh, actually, very soon after that call, he ended up um, at leaving the role or ousted from the role. Actually, I don't know why he actually left. But him and the CFO both left. Um, and maybe it was the board freaking out. I don't know. But Sandeep is no longer with the company anymore. Now we have our new guy. Uh, his name is David Tully. And um, he took over and uh, as well as a bunch of board members left the WeWork board and new board members came in. Everybody who was brought in, including David, um, they're not really real estate people. I think uh, David is from uh, the satellite space where he was a CFO. His primary expertise seems to be M&A, risk management, uh, finance, and a bunch of other board members also got brought in with finance backgrounds. Some of them work for like energy utility companies. So they don't have much real estate experience. Their main expertise is, is finance, banking, investing. Um, and it seems like what the priority is now is number one, preparing WeWork for bankruptcy, or two, trying to do everything they can in the near term to make sure WeWork stops bleeding money. 